I think Ben's questions came about because uh, he's thinking of actually starting to implement some of this stuff and the team is starting to implement some of this stuff. So it's a little more real now. And so I talked with him a little bit on Friday afternoon already, so I don't mind getting started without him. Um, but what I'll do is uh, go through kind of very mechanistically what's going on with voting, um, mostly from the point of view of a single neuron, because uh, everything is pretty much happening. Once you understand what a single neuron is doing, everything else is just sort of emergent uh, from, from that, um, which I think is actually a really nice property of the algorithm. Um, so I'll go through step by step how we learn, uh, how cells learn to associate with other SDRs and then how voting happens and how that uh, kind of maps to our neuron model. Um, and this is somewhat of a repeat of stuff I did before anyway. Um, so it's, uh, it might be a bit repetitive. Um, and then Thanks for all the other questions that came on the on Slack as well, so we can deal with that. Uh, let me go through kind of Ben's question first. Um, we'll go through step by step, and then we can address some of these some of these other questions like feedback and noise, and determinism, and things like that. As long as we don't talk about consciousness, we're okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, and I might end up using all four colors. So hopefully you can see the... All right, so what I've drawn on here is three columns, um, basically using the columns paper as the outline. So I'm not really planning on talking much about grid cells or, or anything else, um, just really the, focusing on the output of the building there. Hey, Ben, let's just get started. Um, um, and if you remember from the columns paper, we had the output layer, we call, what we call the output layer, which is sort of, you know, our mapping would be L23 in the cortical column, and then the input layer, which is where sensory input comes in, uh, layer four. So mostly I'm gonna be talking about the output layer, um, but this is just for the full picture. Uh, and the basic idea is that each cortical column is censoring some subset of the full sensory space and this is moving over over time and what and at any point in time the input layer contains a very unique SDR that corresponds to the particular sensory input at a particular location so this is the location signal and this is the sensory input um, and so this is changing very fast as we move. Um, and at any point in time, the current sensory input is gonna be consistent with a bunch of other possible objects. Um, and the output layer is gonna contain essentially the set of objects that are consistent with all of the sensory input seen up to this point. Uh, that's kind of the most generic. And it's consistent not just with what it sees, but with what everyone else is seeing. So and there's information transfer from other cortical columns as well as uh, over time within a cortical column. Okay, uh, so I guess I'll, what I'll do is I'll focus on column two because it's in the middle. Um, and then we'll sort of walk through step by step here. Any questions so far? Any high level comments? Or... Somehow I feel like I'm a professor right now. <laughs> I'm coming out of class. <laughs> Would that be in the final? <laughs> <laughs> yes, there will be a quiz. <laughs> I think that means for today, we have to call you a doctor in law. Is that right? <laughs> okay, can we vote on the correct answer? Just give one answer. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes voting is not the right way to do, do things. Sometimes it's a dictator approach. <laughs> so I'm going to be a dictator today. Um, Okay, um, and what I find really cool about, like I kind of alluded to, like the entire voting thing can be understood if you just understand what a single neuron is doing and how the behavior of a single neuron depends, how it learns and how it dendrites work. Once you understand a single neuron and the output layer, you can kind of from there derive all of the voting properties, which, which I really like. Um, okay, so, 
Um, yeah, maybe I'll switch to, so this is a neuron in one of these output layers. It looks a lot like neurons in our temporal memory and in the Ben Wright's paper that we just published. So there's sensory input coming in here and there's contextual input that's coming in uh, laterally. And the way this neuron works is slightly different from the temporal memory neuron um, in that if it has, you know, first of all, if it has, if it has, it has to have sufficient sensory input in order, uh, well, actually, yeah, let me take that back. Um, the, basically, the way this neuron works is if you have contextual input coming in, it's going to bias this cell to win. Um, and the neurons which are which have the highest bias from from contextual inputs, those are the ones that are going to uh, be active. What we did in the columns paper is we enforce more stability in the output layer. We just said these these cells are going to be more stable. Um, and so uh, during learning, what we said is there's we just assume there's a signal that says okay we're going to now learn a new object, and everything we're going to see from this point on is this new object. So we enforce these kind of boundaries. We didn't really have a continual learning uh, scenario in that sense. So we said, okay, we're gonna now learn the next object. And do, while it's learning, these cells are just, um, we, we pick a random SDR at each column that represents that object. And we enforce those cells to stay on. So basically in column one, um, maybe I'll just call it O. This is the output representation for object one in, in column one. This one will have a, this column will have an, a, an SDR in column two for the same object. And in column three, uh, it's going to have an SDR for the same object. So these are going to be three different SDRs. What are the subscripts? Yeah. So this is like um, object ID, and this would be like column. If you can see that on the. So the subscript is the object ID, and the superscript is the column ID. So this is all for one object. You're going to get this. For the next object, you get another one. So, so are we those when you're looking at a new object, and is there any similarity between similar objects? No, there's no similarity, they're completely random. So this is one of the potential downsides of what we did in the column paper. Every object is treated as a completely separate uh, random object. Okay, um, and you tell it now you look at a new object, so it should be a new activation. It, yeah. It, okay. Yeah, so during learning, what we say, okay, we're now learning the next object. So we pick a random SDR here, and these are, uh, I think in the paper 40 out of 4,096, something like that, it's pretty sparse, like 1%, and it's pretty high dimensional, uh, 4,096. And um, there's actually some evidence, I think, that layer two, three cells are much sparser than lower level cells, uh, lower layers, and they actually are, are more stable than lower layers. I think we cited some of those papers. Layer two, especially because this is why you never see any reports of activity on layer two because there's hardly any cells active. Yeah. <clears throat> so I think that that matches the the biology. Um, so the interesting thing is that column one might have a completely different SDR from column two and a completely different SDR from column three, even though it's the exact same object. So what these cells have to do in order to vote is to like we focus on column two, these cells have to learn the associations to the SDRs in the neighboring columns in order for voting to work. Like there's no assumption that they're the same. And in fact, I think the way we did it, there doesn't have to be a one-to-one -one relationship. I was talking about this with Ben on, on Friday. Suppose this is a, this is a somat, say column one is a somatosensory, one column two is a visual column, this whole thing could still work. Um, like imagine like you have a coffee mug with a Numenta logo, that might be a specific object um, where you have another coffee mug that's identical shape, but it has I don't know, the box logo on it, right? 
the touch sensors wouldn't be able to tell them apart. So they might have the same SDR for those two objects, um, whereas the visual column would have two different SDRs because then you can tell them apart. So this whole thing should still work uh, in that context. There's no assumption of an exact one-to-one -one mapping throughout. And that's something in Monty, I think we need to be careful about. So um, that's one of the reasons, like if you just use object IDs, uh, that one's not gonna work. You need to have as many to many kind of mapping. Yeah, um, yeah. So, uh, for to uh, for for example, the touch column to have the same representation for the cup with one logo and the other logo, would this automatically happen just from the sensory input being the same, or would you have to tell it, okay, this is the same shape basically during training? Yeah, it, it's a good question. Um, you know, we, we have to solve the problem of when it's, how does it know when it's a new object and when it's not? And I think you talked about some possible ways of doing that. We didn't really address that piece in the, in the columns paper. Um, we, we discussed it internally a little bit. You know, there's gonna be a lot of bursting and a lot of activity if it's an unknown object. And so that could be the trigger for a new signal, uh, potentially. Not for the touch sensor with different logos. Hmm? Not for the touch no, sensor. No, touch sensor would be totally predict. It yeah. would say, oh, I know what this object is, yeah, but the visual columns would not. So that, that could be locally some signal to learn. Uh, but, uh, okay. So during learning, um, let me walk through the learning process. So we, let's say we're learning object one. Um, we invoke an SDR in each of those columns. They're completely random. Um, and and those cells are going to stay stable during the process of learning. So what's going to happen here is um, you get a you you go to some location on the object. Um, and you get a unique SDR here. Um, you get a unique SDR here, a unique SDR there for that single point. And these cells that are active, they will automatically just through heavy and learning, their bottom up synapses, their feed forward synapses are going to learn connections to that unique SDR. So that'll just be straightforward heavy and learning. In addition, we're gonna learn connections on the dendritic segments that correspond to um, activity of the neighboring columns. So this, the other, the next big difference we said in the columns paper is we said each dendritic segment is gonna have uh, synapses from different columns. So what will end up happening here is if you look at a cell, let's say this is a column two cell. Um, this is a cell in column two. This cell is active for object one. It's gonna learn, let's say on this dendritic segment, it's gonna learn object one, one, the SDR for column one. Um, for object one. Here it might learn its own. Okay, so it's going to learn those three as contextual signals on three different dendritic segments. When you say learn those SDRs, you mean it'll respond very strongly to if that SDR is active in the input. Yeah, it's just going to, because uh, we learn by adding and dropping connections, it's going to make form connections to these. Uh, so after, in this setting, after this cell, after you've learned object one, there are going to be three different dendritic segments that have SDRs to the three different columns. So notice that it also has connections to itself, to the columns internally. By itself, I mean uh, to other cells in the same column. Okay, because this whole thing works even with only one column. Uh, and so the learning rule is again, very heavy and light. As, because the cell is active, we're enforcing stability here. As long as it's active, it's gonna learn connections to whatever axons are active that are nearby. So this sort of learning will happen just through pure heavy and learning, but we're ensuring that they're on three different dendritic segments here. Uh, and there is some biological justification for that. Uh, it would be kind of interesting to see if that's actually what happens or not. But um, okay, so is that 
Is that clear? Okay, it should still one. object two. You're first talking about object one. This is all object one right now. Yeah. Wait, you wrote two. Oh. I did check two, but not object two. two. So this is column. This is a set of columns. Oh, it's the O's. Oh, one, two, uh, yeah, so one, the, two, two, so this is the subscript is the object ID and the superscript is the column. It looks like a two. Where? The subscript. The subscript. Oh, it does? Oh, yes. oh, oh, okay. I write my ones like this. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. I can fix that. That's fine. Okay, um, now let's say we're learning object two. We're again going to pick a random set of cells in each column. Um, it's actually possible for the same cell to participate in multiple object IDs. Right, so the exact same cell could become active for column for object two as well. It, it wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be, it's almost certain it would, right? If it's a 1% sparsity, then one out of 100 patterns, that cell would participate in, right? So it's like a 1% yeah, chance. Learn, as we learn more and more objects, uh, every cell is going to participate in multiple objects. Yeah. yeah. Um, so in general, uh, but the chance of a high overlap is really small. And, um, and we know the math for that. Um, but in general, a particular cell can be involved in more than one object. So we can say, okay, this cell is involved in object two as well, just to be, just to be honorary. So I just want to double check. There, the entire output, the entire SDR from one column is being received on a single dendrite of one of these cells. So if there are 40 cells, <coughs> All 40 synapses, all 40 cells have a synaptic connection to this one dendrite. Uh, no. Okay. So the question is, you know, if there are 40 cells active here, do all 40 cells make connections here, here, and here? Now, in general, our, our learning rule uh, always subsamples from the input. So, um, and as long as you have enough synapses, the whole thing works with very, very high probability. So that's all covered in the STR math. Okay. So if, you have, if there's 40 cells active, we might have, let's say, 20 or 30 synapses. We might subsample from there. Okay. Yeah. Could we put a tilde over O up here? Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's a detail, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a good, it's a good point. And this, this is why the numbers really matter. Um, and someone asked about noise robustness, I think, in, the, in Slack. Um, it was, but it, it's important to get the noise, the numbers correct for the noise stuff to all work out, and also to get the capacity high enough. Can I make an additional comment related yeah. to that, I think? Imagine you had 1,000 columns, not three. Uh, we're not going to have 1,000 dendritic segments. What's important for a dendritic segment is it has some minimum threshold of synapses, let's say 20 create a dendritic spike. And I've said this many times, but when it's not actually essential that a dendritic branch, a segment is always sampling from one column and another dendritic branch is sampling from another column. What does it matter if I have a thousand columns, it turns out that you could, you could pick 20 synapses or 30 synapses from some subset of the thousand columns. And if they're all trying to represent the same thing, it's still gonna work. Like I could get one synapse from column one, one synapse from column 47, one synapse from 302, whatever. So this is the way you've laid it out, Zubita is a nice way of thinking about it, but it doesn't have to be strict like this. Um, that yeah, I, I think we can relax this quite a bit, maybe yeah. all the way to one dendritic segment. Uh, well, or, or it's just that I didn't, want, I didn't want people to think like, well, we have to have 20 synapses from one column and one synapse dendrite and that's one. So no, that would work. And that's a good way of thinking about it. But really what matters is that you're, the way to think about this, if you have a thousand columns that are all participating, then you just have to do a subsample across all those thousand columns. Because that, that SDR, that larger SDR across thousand columns is still an SDR for the object. So you're just subsampling from that larger SDR. Yeah. Um, it, it all work. So uh, nothing, I, I don't think you have to redraw what you've shown here. I just want to make clear that it's, 
it's not strict like this at all. Yeah, yeah. I'm just strictly describing what's in the columns paper, but uh, yeah. this would actually be a really nice extension is to show that we don't need to do this exactly. Someone yeah. else asked also in Slack whether um, if you have lots and lots of columns, are they all, is this column getting input from all other columns or how does that work? So that also is not necessary and I can address that later as well. That one we did test with the uh, one of our interns uh, actually ran simulations on that. We tested that. There, I forgot that the, what the, they just said that we're not going to get any input from these columns and, and see what happens. Yeah, well, suppose you have topology. Uh, you can make sure that each column is connected to its uh, neighboring columns, but. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, know, yeah. you don't have to. So, but the information still travels pretty fast. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, I don't want to get off on a tangent here, but when I look at these long range connections across the, you know, from the left side of the brain to the right side of the brain, an individual axon may make, you know, a thousand synapses over there, but they're all over the place. They're not in any one location. It almost seems like they're random and all that would work. Um, you don't need to sample every column and you don't need to have every, you know, it's just, as long as you got 20 synapses from the ensemble, you're good. Yeah. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, and, and I think I want to stress again, all this SDR math becomes super critical and it, it, and it sort of shows under what regimes this whole thing is going to work. Um, it, works, it works pretty nicely. In, in terms of number of synapses on the dendritic segment, the answer is always like 20 to 30. It doesn't matter how many columns, how many objects, how many whatever, it's always 20 to 30. <laughs> and the threshold is like 10 to 15. So right. those are all good numbers. Um, gotcha. So it's like there's like a floor there, 20 to 31 synapses per oh, synapse. segment, yeah. Um, and it just always works out. It's kind of magical. <laughs> um, okay, where was I going? Okay, so let's say this cell is active also for object two. Um, so I think you can now realize that this thing is going to learn all of those Synapses on here. Um, yeah, so these dendritic segments are, are going to get filled up uh, with stuff. Um, okay, so this basically this is this is it from a single cell standpoint. That is the full learning algorithm. Um, as long as it's and the it's basically a heavy end style thing. As long as it's active, it's going to form connections to all of the feed forward inputs that are active and it's going to form connections laterally to based uh, in the way I described but, but it, as long as this is active it's going to form those connections so it's a heavy and style uh, learning rule it's a it's completely unsupervised this cell doesn't know anything about it actually doesn't know about other cortical columns it doesn't know about um, well, I guess it, it it's it's forced to Segment it out this way, but that may not be necessary. But it doesn't really know anything about voting or other stuff. It just knows to form connections. <laughs> um, and I should mention the bottom up stuff. At, for a given object, we're going to sense multiple sensory inputs, multiple features as we move along. Each one of those is going to correspond to some very sparse SDR coming up here. So this thing is going to learn a union of a bunch of synapses coming from below. So uh, it's going to learn for feature one, the sparse, a subset of, the, again, a subset of the sparse SDR coming up from below for feature one. It's going to form connections there. And then when you go to feature two, there'll be another sparse SDR. It's going to learn another subset of connections here and so on. So it's going to learn a union of those. So you can see this, it's starting to learn more and more synapses. So we are pretty worried about the capacity uh, issues and how many synapses and can we even talk about that we tested that quite a bit in the paper. yeah okay i just also want to clarify uh the learning actually i think i if i remember correctly it happens on one dendritic segment and with uh synapses local to the synapses that were active so it's like if that dendritic segment turns on and then the neuron with those dendrites are attached to fires the update is specific to that dendrite that was on and specific to those synapses that were active on. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, just wanted to clarify that. And in this particular algorithm, everything is kind of deterministic and discrete and, you know, there's no noise in the output. So it's just, it's just going to form connections to those synapses. Um, 
And it's the permanences that are increasing. Isn't permanences it? are increased, yeah. Um, okay, any questions on the learning? That's basically it for the learning. Well, one, one quick question. Um, is there semantically anything interesting going on with the fact that dendrites branch other than the fact that that provides more opportunities for axons to connect with them? Is there any sense of, you know, uh, you know, uh, more or less forks have an effect on what the results are going to be? Um, the more dendritic segments we have, the more capacity to learn all of these lateral connections. Uh, so that's there. It doesn't actually have to be tied to the forks and the branches. You can have local, loc physically local segments that are on the same branch can be isolated from one another. That's okay. a property of the Okay, so it's, 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 it's strictly it provides for more connectivity. There's there's nothing about uh, a higher fork or a lower fork being dominated one over the other or something. Yeah, the forks uh, forks. I think of it as just as a way physically to allow the dendrites to cover more space. It doesn't okay. have any algorithmic. It is not strictly. It's not true in neuroscience. There are some impact, but at a high level, there's really no nothing important about the branching factor or anything like that. Yeah, that's why we okay. modeled it. But you know, Kevin, it's a good point because as Subhach I just mentioned, there is some there is some evidence. It's not very clear that you know. Um, there is a sort of a, an ordering to a branch that's above a, above a fork and a, a branch that's below a fork. And some people have tried to make arguments about the sequential activation should occur along from the, from the extreme end of the dendrite towards the soma. But it, the evidence is not clear and we, we just didn't try to incorporate anything like that. But it may, it may be true that there's some computational thing going on, but uh, it's not clear and we didn't model it. Yeah, I think from what I understand, once you have a dendritic spike, that is so large that it swamps out all these other effects. Uh, mm. so um, well, there's some people who, some people have taken the neuroscientists have taken this idea that you know, the branching is critical because it, because the way they used to model dendrites, the, the model would still work at the branches. And so, so there's, I, I'm pointing out in the literature, you'll see some people speculating about yeah. the roles of the branches, but as super type pointed out, we, did, we didn't see a need for it. Yeah, you can always definitely measure, you know, measure things that are different depending on branching factors. The question is, does it have any real functional impact? Okay. So, okay. We, so we, we think that's like a third or fourth order. Maybe, maybe, yeah, one more little point on this. If you just like depolarize the dendrite to a small amount, well, that the depolarization gets totally screwed up once you go through a, a branch. Um, but if you have, as Superdai just said, if you have a dendritic spike, it goes right through it. And uh, the evidence is it continues on to get to the soma. So um, that, that's just one little more piece of data on that. Okay. Th th thanks for uh, saying where our state of knowledge is on that. So, so if, <clears throat> if one dendrite, dendritic segment, Fires, that's sufficient if it corresponds to the sensor. One, of those. one dendritic segment is sufficient to prime the cell, to right. have caught a right. bias on the cell. Yeah. Uh, one more question we're getting to the O's you wrote there. You have O object ID one and two now. What way are they mixed? Because they wouldn't know what is the object. Yeah, they don't know anything about objects. I mean, I mean, it's just learning patterns on the dendritic segment. Right. So it just happens to learn. This one is the pattern for object one from column one. Um, this is the pattern for object one from its own column uh, and connections to object one from column three SDRs. So this is object two, column one, object two. Column so, so the column one happens to connect to two separate segments. Yeah, and that's totally fine. In this particular, cell, uh, I'm assuming the cell, this cell is active both for object one and object two. In, in, um, but very small number of cells here will be active for both object one and object two. In fact, it will be a really small chance of that happening. But in general, a given cell will definitely participate in multiple objects as, as you get to high capacity. So how many of those multiple branches you have for each column. 
for one. Well, this is for a cell. For oh, this cell, yeah. Yeah. How many um, connections does it have to one of the columns? How many branches to one of the columns? How many segments to one of the columns? In this example, there are two. In this example, there are two. So it will end up depending on how many objects this cell becomes active for. So if it's object, if it's active for 10 different objects, then it'll have 10 different connections to column one and 10 different collections. Oh, that's yeah. variable during training. Yeah, it's just random chance. Um, the number of segments is random chance. <laughs> it's the, red, the number of segments is related to how often that cell gets chosen for different objects. So if it just by random chance happens to get chosen for lots of objects, it's going to end up with more connections. Again, none of this, I'm, I'm describing a very strict version of the algorithm as implemented, like Jeff said, this can be loosened up dramatically and uh, you don't need to have so many connections and so on, but that would be kind of a nice exercise for someone to go through. Um, oh, can so, one, then, oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, can, can one dendritic segment participate in multiple objects, for example, if it's the same sensory input? Um, wait, you say, can the same dendritic segment participate from multiple objects? Yeah, like if one of those shorter lines would have multiple O's written on it. So, for example, well, um, in, in, it, it, it can in general in the in the paper we enforced it so it didn't, but you could have segments that are overloaded um, that are just again we didn't implement that, but in general this can be very loose. You could potentially have multiple a given segment could have connections from multiple uh, at different times just by random chance. So it could be overloaded. It just gets to a question of what the capacity is and how many synapses you allow per dendritic segment and kind of randomness. And uh, uh, another way to think about this is this is an idealized version of a real neuron. What Suitai is showing is every dendritic segment is recognizing a single pattern. So that would be like 30 synapses in our example here. But real dendritic segments are much longer than that. They may have hundreds of synapses on them, but only a 40 micron area of that dendritic segment is is, is can, can recognize a pattern. So you can think of it that in a real neuron, a bunch of these segments of subatai has drawn them can actually be sequentially aligned along a dendritic branch, a real neuron. Mm -hmm. so, so a real neuron literally may have 400 or 500 synapses along a dendritic segment, but any 40 micron segment acts as a, a twin sense detector. So there's gonna be a whole bunch of these twin sense detectors aligned along the dendrite. It doesn't make any difference the way Subutai's drawn it is just, it's functionally equivalent. Um, but it, if you're thinking about real neurons, it wouldn't be like this. Yeah, basically with real neurons, the answer to almost every question is yes. It's just very messy. <laughs> <nice. laughs> <laughs> but you just have to make sure that on average, if things work out and yeah, um, they're extremely, they're tolerant to so many different variations like this. Yeah. Maybe it's also more like a tree or, or roots, right? It's the branching, branch, yeah, it's like a branching. branching, 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 yeah. branching. yeah, but it's not so as branching. It is not as branchy as you think. That's my point. On many neurons, these segments are really long. And again, they can have four or 500 synapses on them. So we don't, it's functionally equivalent to just saying, give, make each 40 micron segment and call it a segment. And, and that's what Subutai has drawn here. Um, again, I, th I think you have to be careful when we mix like the model versus the real neurons. Yeah. Yeah, the way that I interpreted Vivian's uh, question was that in any given 40 synapse connection, we say 20 is enough to excite it. Well, uh, a separate object could excite, say, the other another set of 20 on there, in right. which case there wouldn't be that overlap uh, explicitly, not requiring any kind of sequentiality at all. Right. That would still work just fine. Yeah, that's what difference. I was calling these overloaded segments. That, that, that would work yeah. too. Um, I, I actually meant. Um... <laughs> Since I'm interpreting those as kind of pattern detectors, what if a different object comes with the same pattern, like with the coffee cup with two different logos on it, there are two distinct objects, but on a touch column, it's two times the same pattern. So the same dendritic segment that encodes this pattern of the cup morphology yeah. should both be activated, but it's two different objects. 
Yeah, yeah. The way the learning algorithm works there is if if there is sufficient activity on a segment, then it would pick that segment to learn on automatically anyway. Is that segment? So in this case, if you've already learned an SDR for a cup from the somatosensory column, and you get that same thing again for a new object, that same dendritic segment would still be active and it would still learn that. So, um, yeah, I, I thought you meant two completely different objects on the same dendritic segment. So that's, uh, but yeah, if it's the same SDR, it would pick the but same segment. Same object. Well, no, the, the, in the somatosensory case, it would be, it would be people think one. it's the same object, but it's actually a different object. Yeah, but the definition would be the same. From the somatosensory, from the somatosensory would, yeah, yeah, the, yeah. Somatosensory. So the same segment would become active, and the same segment would learn in the temporal memory rules. But in fact, it's only if you I, don't find a matching segment that you start to pick new things. So what, the way I feel is, if you have if you have two cups that look different but feel the same, on the columns that represent touch, there'd only be one representation. It would be the, the, the morphological feeling cup, and on the visual columns, you'd have two representations. And so the, the representation in the touch columns would uh, could would be a, would would basically be associated with two different objects in the visual column. So if I I would say oh I know what this is from a feel but I can't be certain which of the two objects it is from a visual point of view. But so there's a, a one to many mapping from one modality to another, and that's all consistent uh, with how this would work. Although we didn't model that, um, that would be consistent. So the touch columns wouldn't know the difference between a, a, a nomentic cup and a non nomentic cup. It's another thing someone could sort of play with and see what the issues are. Uh, let me talk about inference, what happens in inference. So hopefully you have a good sense of learning. Uh, you have another very, very brief. It's just what are the biological constraints for how long these horizontal connections can be? So if it's two, but there's like maybe like 500 columns, can column two still reach? Um, yeah, some well, some connections are really long, like Jeff was saying. In general, like in the visual system, you might see that it goes several cortical columns on both sides, maybe half a dozen or something like that. But in but there are axons which go like all the way from one side of the brain to the other. Okay. Um, so I think Jeff's brought up that you know sometimes the cortical columns for your left fingertip connect to cortical columns from your right fingertip, which are completely in the other hemisphere in your in your brain, because quite often you're using two hands to all that. Maybe once you think about voting, it makes total sense that it would be that way. But um, it has some very, very long range. Is yeah. it known to how many columns one column connects? It, um, it varies a lot. So there, I can show you one image that I was showing uh, Ben on Friday that shows us sort of three to six on each side uh, in the visual system of this particular animal. But I think that's that can vary quite a bit by level of the hierarchy, sensory modality, animal, yeah. whatever. But I, even think, those, I think it almost doesn't matter. Yeah, uh, and even those, the, the when the neuroscientists look at this, they'll, they'll, there's an axon coming out of the bottom of the neuron, and they try to follow where that axon goes. Well, if they look locally, they'll see, oh, it goes as the next column over, the next column over, and so on. But one of the definitions of pyramidal cells is that a branch of the axon, a branch, always exit the bottom of the neocortex. That, by definition, it always happens. So they often will ignore that. Like, well, well, that branch goes all over the place. So some neuroscientists will look at the local projections and say, oh, it goes, so these are a couple of millimeters this way and several millimeters that way. But that cell is guaranteed to leave the cortex and go across the white matter and enter someplace else. But one way to think about it, like how many columns can an individual col cell attach to? Well, individual cells have up to about 10,000 synapses, um, maybe five to 10. The number is very difficult to find a good answer for that. Um, so that limits how many different, that essentially limits how many different columns an individual cell can get connections to. So this is why I kept going back to earlier. When you make long range projections, it really doesn't have to connect to every column. It could connect to a very sparse set of columns and it'll work just fine, as long as all the neurons are doing the same. So um, as I think Subasai said, it's, it's kind of a red herring to think about it too much. Just assume that you're gonna make enough connections um, uh, sufficient to meet the rules of SDR matching. 
And, uh, and, and this model we're showing here is a very, a very uh, constrained uh, model that illustrates all the points. Yeah, it's essentially if you need to make, if you need to do voting across two different columns, uh, it doesn't matter what the distance is, um, that probably will be something, but or the possibility for something. I think if we're designing a system, we may want to put some of that bias in, like the axon going from one side of my finger to the other finger, from my left hand to the right hand, that's probably genetically determined. It's not going to happen by random chance just through learning. So that's those are kinds of biases we may want to build into a system uh, that could depend a lot on the situation and, and stuff. So that could be an area of exploration. It's sort of almost like how do you initialize a wave matrix? You want to put some sort of biases in. And that will determine what can vote and what can't vote. But locally, um, I think this can just happen as a function of learning. So maybe you'll cover this when you talk about inference, but if we're trying to design a system, do we know anything about what's optimal? So we definitely need enough voting connections to be useful. On the other hand, can you have too many voting connections? What if it's all to all? Is that actually less optimal than some slightly less connected? Maybe it'll be slower. It'll be a lot slower. Okay. And take a lot and take a lot more memory. Yeah, a lot right? of energy. Yeah. yeah it's you, you kind of want the smallest number of connections, but no less than that. But is there an information? <laughs> to paraphrase Einstein. <laughs> That's, okay, so the, yeah, the energy, the energy and speed are important components. Is there an information component though to have it that's bad about having too many connections? I could imagine a case where this might show up. So that's kind of why I'm asking. I have to think about it. I can't think of one off the top of my head. I, I mean, I well, guess you know, you, you it could, could saturate be, in some sense, but I don't know. I think you have to ask that question with the, asking about the threshold of a, of a dendritic segment. If the threshold of a dendritic segment is 20 synapses being active, well, if you now put, you know, 10,000 synapses on that dendrite, not that you can, but if you, in software you did that, and you only have a threshold of 20, but you're increasing, you're increasing their chances of having false positives, I'm not sure, I don't know if that would actually be a problem or not, but my point is it's certainly not, you're not gaining anything from it. Um, you only need 20 to be active. Why, why give me 10,000, you know? Um, it's, you're trying to detect a single pattern and, and if you sampling 10, you know, I don't know, it doesn't seem like there's any, only, it can only be the downside, there's no upside to it. So there are yeah, enough there advantages to have. Yeah, other than computational efficiency, <coughs> just standing here, I can't think of a downside to it. But also, it, I mean, one possibility would be false positives. Um, no, I mean, with these learning rules, you shouldn't get false positives. Um, really, even if you have 10,000, so, I mean. You're not gonna make wrong, I, I mean, I'm assuming effect. you're still not gonna make incorrect connections, right? You're still gonna connect to uh, the same you know, object IDs and SDRs and, and, and the right columns and so on. It's just that instead of subsampling, you have all of them, right? That's your connection, that's your question. Okay, a brief follow-up question on that. Uh, when you said it would be slower, is that because the software is gonna be slower or is it because if I have more connections and I'm taking the union in of all these other SDRs, I'm gonna get this big fat union and no, the unions take wouldn't more be any, steps to- No, the unions down. wouldn't be any bigger. In that case, it's just union is just still the union of objects that are consistent with uh, sensory input. So the union. I assume, the, I assume slower. You that, did you mean by slower super tie that you just have to go and and look at all those synapses? We have to somehow sequentially yeah. go through them. I guess slower. I'm assuming a sparse computer. <laughs> <laughs> if it's a GPU that's always doing everything to everything, I guess it's not any slower. But um, I'm assuming it's, it's yeah, it's the it's somehow it's dependent on the number of non zeros. So um, it'll have to compute max with a lot more synapses and it's going to be using up more energy. Certainly in the biology, it's going to use up way more energy. Than, and, and you just physically couldn't fit all the connections. It's been argued that, that synapses
the number of synapses is the determining factor in energy usage in the brain. That's not necessarily true in software, but in the brain. And so the brain really, even though it has a good synapses, it really wants to reduce them. Uh, and its method for doing that is to rely completely on sparsity for everything. And, and, and Subutai's done the math on this and it works out beautifully. So um, yeah, just that's another little biological data point that synapses are, are um, energy. Um, of course, any individual synapse doesn't take much energy, but they are active processes and they need to, they do active, they consume energy, but you, you, you start putting, you know, you know, 500, you know, billion synapses someplace, it comes to be a lot of energy. Okay, let's talk about inference. Um, the inference rule for this cell is, is pretty straightforward. Um, first, it needs to get sufficient amount of bottom-up inputs in order to become active. Um, but hold on to that thought later. <laughs> but it needs to get sufficient input from bottom-up to, to become active. Um, but that's not enough. It also has to win in the winner-take-all competition. And so what happens is within a column, uh, we're going to take the cells which have the most number of dendritic segments active, and those will be the winners. Okay. So if you have some cell that has three dendritic segments active and enough bottom-up input, another cell has four dendritic segments active, and enough before it, but the ones with four segments active are going to win. So the more segments you have, um, uh, you, you know, segments on a single neuron or on different neurons? On, that, on this neuron. So in order for this guy to win, it has to have enough bottom up input, and it's in the number of segments that are on has to be in the, in the top range. So we say in your diagram, what you give, give six of these um, horizontal lines, that's not considered one segment. That's just uh, these are six segments. Okay, this is yeah. So this is different from what we did in the, okay. uh, the continual learning paper. There, if you had even one, you would just pick one segment and that would bias the. That means uh, multiple segments are learning um, the same object? Well, in this way. So these three segments are learning three different SDRs for the oh, same okay. object. Um, so that's basically it. That's the rule. <laughs> and so the way this would actually, the phenomena that would happen would be you get some bottom-up input and let's say, um, uh, if we look at column two, and here's time. And so you get some input such that the input is consistent with two different objects in here, um, object one and object two. Those two SDRs will be active. Um, and in column three, let's say the input is only consistent with object one. Okay, so you get the SDR for object one will become active. Okay. So at this point in time, um, all the cells Yeah, so the cells that represent object one are gonna get lateral support locally from the other cells that represent object one and the cells here that represent object one. So in, in these cells, there are gonna be two dendritic segments active. In the object two cells, it's only gonna get support internally. So it's only gonna have one dendritic segment active. So what'll happen is that this will basically the object one cells will be the ones that went out. So it's, um, this is what we mean by voting. Um, so object one cells are gonna get two votes, one internally, one from the neighboring column. And then this one's only gonna get one vote, so it, only the one with the most votes wins. Okay, so this is the simplest, a simple case. Um, yeah, could we extend it to a case where let's say column one is very, very confident, it's got to be this object, and, and maybe column three is not as confident? This yeah, yeah, that could be another extension. We didn't really 
model confidence uh, in here or noise or each signal works. Yeah, there it is. You have the strength of the synapse, right? If if the if the weight that was learned with heavy and learning is stronger, then the boat is weighted a bit more, right? Uh, no, we, the way we did it is the the strength is just a permanence, so it's either determines whether it's connected or not, but the impact is binary. So we didn't have a weight oh, like okay. we do with deep learning. But biologically speaking, there are two sources of, of input strength here would be the strength of the synapses and also the firing rate of the cells. So cells in layer two, three, and one column could just be firing faster than in another column, which would lead to possibly more activity. Yeah. In, 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 in yeah. Voting. yeah, we sort of waved our hands. Um, this cell, if it has the more dendritic segments are active, the quicker it would fire. And that could be enough to um, win in the local winner take all. Or it could be like you're saying, maybe it just fires more, more often or something. But anyway, that's the rule. It's, it's just whichever cells have the most dendritic segments active, those are the ones that could end up with. Um, another. Here we can look at column one. I mean, we can make this a little more complicated. I'll just do A, B, C instead of one. So let's say this is consistent with objects A and B. This is consistent with object B and C. And this is consistent with object C and A. What would happen in this case? I'm confused. You're confused. Um, that's that's what's going to happen. Oh, okay, okay. I thought you were. I thought you were <laughs> no, no, I know. I was being. I was trying to make a joke. Yeah, but, but you shouldn't answer work. the question because <laughs> you're like the TA today. You can. <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'll mute myself. Here we go. <laughs> And what would happen? Well, first of all, what do you think would end up becoming active here? What, what, which cells would stay active? It's a union of all of them, right? Because there's an equal amount of support for every single object. What do you mean? So if I A, yeah. um, for A, I have support in my column, but also in column three. B is support in, in my column, but also in column two. And C, same, for yeah. two and three. Each one has an equal amount of support, which means I have a union of all of them, and it's, yeah. I am confused. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So th that's exactly correct. So each each cell would exact have exactly two votes, uh, two sets of votes, and so there's no you can't tell the difference at all. So they just keep they all they'll all this union they will all become active. So maybe 80 cells active here, maybe 79 cells active here because one cell is shared. You know, 80 cells active here or something like that. So it would be just a, a, a large union would be there. So if, if we would assume we cut the connection between column two and column three, so they're not connected, but the rest of the connection stays, would then object B win? So say that again. So if these are not connected. Yeah. Um, well, B would win here, but C and A would still be active here. Okay, so it doesn't matter if, if two columns already agree on one object, it's still the same weight if it it's still just one vote if it communicates. Yeah, I mean that would be that would be a weird situation though. It's like you're getting you're getting input that's consistent with B here, but it's not consistent with B here. So then what are you actually sensing? Are you actually are you actually sensing two different objects? No, in that no case? it would be this um, there's no communication between two and three then B would win in column two, A would win in column three, and then we still have A, B in column one. A, well, A, well if there's no connection from column three to these guys, then- No, three. just two and three. Oh, but three is still connected to one? Yes, yeah, look at me. Just two and three is missing. So, so oh, then, C, then you think the, it still works. We lose the C support. Because you have A and B in that Yeah, just A. You know, in some sense, it doesn't. If you say column this two, may not actually be, this may not actually be possible. I just forgot. So, can I, can I can I comment? Should I be quiet? Yeah, yeah. No. Sorry. Uh, no problem. Um, first of all, remember what I said earlier. We're thinking about lots of columns. 
The fact that two and three aren't connected really doesn't matter. It's the entire network which is trying to settle. So you don't need a direction connection between any two columns, as long as all the columns somehow reach each other indirectly or indirectly. And, and, and in this case, there is no answer. This would be something that you'd find very puzzling. You'd be sitting there scratching your head saying, this doesn't make any sense at all. Yeah, yeah. So maybe it is not a good... Uh, you know what? I think it's interesting. I think we should just maybe do this. Yeah. Yeah, no, I was just trying to figure out if the connectivity plays any role in, in there. It, it, it does, but it, in general, when we modeled it, um, they, these things still settle pretty fast. Um, we, the question is, you know, how much uh, could you ever... Well, sounds like we'll get to see it. Yeah. I think, this, I think this actually relates to to the, the task of identifying objects tossed into a box. Um, because you have multiple objects and um, they are, you know, they're butting up against one another and they're not complete. Um, and so what I would imagine would be happening in the scenario, well, this is true. If you look at actually the columns in a particular region of the cortex, they're more heavily connected to nearby columns. And the further and further away you go, the sparser the connections are. And so there would be a bias towards a local group reaching a consensus that even if that local group is inconsistent with some distant columns. So imagine you're looking at an ob a partial object in the box, I forget was in there, some yellow serial box or something, I don't know, I can't remember. Um, some of these columns could say locally, that, hey, you know what, we're all together here in some local region of the cortex and we all agree that we're seeing you know, object A but there's some other people over there who aren't, and they're not as heavily connected to us, and they think they're seeing object B. Uh, it's quite possible that, you know, the system will say, well, let's focus on one of these at a time, A, and then move over there, we'll focus on another one, B. But the distant connections could be ignored uh, because they're fewer. So that, I think that's something like that's likely happening. Um, they're not, all connections between all columns aren't equal. They're, they are sparser the further away you get. So um, you could reach a local, this, this example doesn't show it, but you could le reach a local consensus that says, well, at least the, the center of the visual field or the tips of my five fingers and my right hand are all agreeing on something, even if some other columns further away are not agreeing with us. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we didn't really model, we didn't uh, model or, or test out that scenario. But I think the way to think about it is there's, at least from the columns favor perspective, is there's some true object that you're sensing. And everything is going to be consistent with that object. So we could we should make sure there's like a the true object is let's say it's equal to B here. So everything's going to always be consistent with B. You're never going to sense something that's not consistent with B. Uh, uh, here. So here, here's an example. You know, this finger, let's say these are different fingers. This finger is sensing a feature that's consistent with A and B. This one would B and C, and this one would C, A, and B. So but in this, I'm sorry? That, that's assuming that every column has a model of B, right? This assumes every column has a model of B, yeah. Um, and we, we assumed every column has learned every object. Yeah. And um, yeah, so what would happen in, in this case? B yeah. would win. Why is that? Because you get the most relative three, which is three. Yeah, so each cell here would get three, a vote of three. So you very you just basically end up um, at least right for that. Like you'll end up these guys are not gonna win. And it's going to this way. Um, yeah, so something else that could happen is again, let's say the true object is B. You get uh, a, B, C, D here, B, C, D, um, B, C, A. So what would happen here? Karen, do you want to take a crack? Put <laughs> <laughs> you on the spot. <laughs> well, you have an equal votes for B and C. So they both win. Yeah, so what would happen here is the B and C ones would, would stay. <laughs> 
So this one, the system still hasn't uniquely converged. Okay. And so now we have to sense something else to really uniquely converge. So uh, um, when the column doesn't learn the object, doesn't know about the object, it doesn't evolve. So it evolves something wrong. We're assuming every column knows right, about what it does. Well, then the, um, you'd get like a burst of activity, right, I yeah, guess. Yeah. And, or you wouldn't get, actually, you wouldn't get that yeah, activity at all. Both. Yeah. Yeah, you wouldn't, you wouldn't get enough temporal memory. Right, so that AC will never happen before. Correct, yeah. yeah. There'll be an empty column to move on. Something like that. So here, um, in the next step, you might, you'll sense another three features. So here you might get B, C, A. Here you might get D, B. No, you won't. No, okay. Yeah, you would say that. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, let me. Um, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna trick you guys here. It's not gonna find. So this this could happen. I'm gonna, uh, <laughs> this could happen. So um, now column one is sensing a feature which is consistent with B, C, and D. Uh, column two with A, B, C, and D, and column three with B, C, D. So what happens in this case? Ben, do you want to? <laughs> this is a trickier case. Throwing me under the bus. Yeah, so I'm going to say who, who will end up winning. Uh, definitely in columns one and three, uh, B, C, and D should remain active, and in column two, probably it would just eliminate A. Yeah, so that's not correct. Um, <laughs> thanks a lot. <laughs> 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 it's probably because I forgot to say something earlier. <laughs> Is that the, the uh, remember these things are are more stable. So if it was, it also has to be stable in the previous time step. It also has to be firing in the previous time step in order to win. Oh, we're talking. This is this is time. Yeah, yeah. I'm step. sorry. This is time here. So this is sensation one. This is sensation two. Right. So what would happen here is that actually this D cell will not win, even though it has lateral support, it doesn't have um, support from the previous time step. And then these, this one will also not win. So it'll still be B and C. So it'll stay locked into B and C. This is similar to the temporal memory mechanism. It's going to stay locked into the specific subset, even when it gets other confusing input. Wait, how is, that, how is that possible? Because at time step one, you had to be receiving sensory input that was associated with D in column one. Yeah. Okay, and then in time step two. Um, but remember, after this, what stays active are only the VC cells because of this voting. So even though it got information so. consistent with D, only the B and C cells would stay active. But what's happening at time step two as far as the raw sensory input that made D come online? Um, you're sensing some, you move your finger to another location that happens to be consistent with these three objects. Okay, so it's getting sensory support for D. Yeah. It's getting lateral support for D. Yeah, but not from the previous tensor. So there's some persistence that we have. The cells then associated with D aren't depolarized, right? Because they never were active in the previous time step. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I forget the exact rule. I have to look at the paper again, but we, you have to be active in the previous yeah. time step in order to stay active. Remember the way to think about think this. Just enforce one, one more time step of stability in here. So the depolarization yeah. lasted a little bit longer. There's, what we're trying to do is you're trying to narrow down your possible answers. And there's two ways you could do it. A single column can do it by sensing over time, right? So, uh, and, and then multiple columns can do it by voting at the same time, but they're all trying to do the same thing. In this example, the only, you know, D is not consistent across time and space. It's, it's, it's five out of six of them, but not six out of six. Well, B and C are consistent across five out of six, six out of six. And so it's, it's just, you're, you've got two ways of eliminating it by movement and by voting. And, and, and they're both doing the same thing. So. Imagine if I was just using column three when I, and, and I move my finger, well, I, I wouldn't introduce D because BC is the only thing that's consistent with time one and time two. So in that way, just look at how many Ds are there versus how many Bs and Cs are there. And you're gonna see it's 
D is not a, is not a contender because it didn't exist through time. Yeah, it's, I think it's, I think that's right. The way to think of it is just think about one particle column over time first. Um, and the, the things have to be active the previous time step in addition to the current uh, activity from the current time step. So it's kind of what Abhi said, that the depolarization in the B and C cells last a lot, one step longer. So really there's more than two time steps here. Like column one had A, B, C, D, then it voted and it went down to yeah. B, C. Yes. Then in the next step, it had uh, B, C, and D. E. D came back Brief, alive. Briefly, yeah. It yeah. came back alive, but actually, yeah, what's going on? There? Yeah, so there's these, so these are different sensations. And for each sensation, there are a couple of time steps. In between. So, so there's like a sensation step and then a voting step exactly. and then a sensation step. Yeah. So did so if the yeah I don't understand this. If the idea is that you can't if D can't be resurrected, how well if, if these if these things so the persistence is if if these cells are active through voting, um, they're going to stay active. They're going to be strongly active. So they're not even going to let these D cells become active. They're just going to this the winner take all mechanism is just says uh, you know I'm the I'm the leader. Here. They're not gonna, they're just strongly active. So then the real sequence should be A, B, C, D sensation step, B, C voting step. Yeah. B, C sensation step. D just never got resurrected. It never got resurrected. Yeah. This would be kind of the information that's consistent with D. Yeah. So I guess if I were to really draw out the neurons, uh, it would be. It, you know, what we're not sure. But that, what you said is correct. I think. What what you're not showing is is here on your left panel. You're showing the uh, uh, the features, the sensory location layer, yeah. and at that point, when a new sensory input comes in, even though that sensory input uh, would be uh, might be D, you're not going to get. Uh, it, it, it's already going to be narrowed down there as well. I, you're not really that, that column isn't. That column is already said a sort of uh, its its location layer. Uh, how am I saying this? Um, and even in the column, you're trying to narrow down to a very sparse representation. So you, you may not even represent D anymore because um, because D is inconsistent with the location. And and uh, uh, maybe I'm not making sense. But my point is, it's, there's it's there's more going on here too. And I think the way which I present is correct, but. You know, yeah, it's column. a little too, I, I went probably a little too fast. I, I should do it the way you, you just said it then, is that I should say, okay, here's the information from the lower layer that's consistent with these objects. Here's the actual cells that initially become active and here are the ones that win. Right? And then the next level, here's the information coming in. It's consistent with B, C, and D, but the, because the B, C cells are still active, these would never, in the output layer, these cells would never become active. Right, right. If you think of it like a temporal memory, like a learning melody, yeah, yeah. You, you you hear two notes in the melody. You've now eliminated a whole bunch of of uh, possibilities. A third note comes in. Well, that third note could be in any other melody, but we're not going to even represent it. And, and we're only going to represent it if it's possible to represent it in the two choices we currently know. It's like we we there's temporal there's temporal memory here. There's the system is not it, it's narrowing down over time, so you can't go back and represent that D. Uh, it's just not it's, the input's going to be D, but pretty consistent with D. But the input is not going to be represented. It's only going to be represented in the context of B and C. Yeah, so how to make it robust against like one one mistake, one, like one off note? Yeah, so that's something we uh, that's a separate thing that someone could work through. Um, but I think that needs some additional work to make it really robust or something like that. Um, yeah, you have to remember this is like. We didn't even know how any of this would be possible at all with neurons. And so the fact that we just worked on the simplest thing. And it's just even the whole idea of having a location. I mean, the point of the Collins paper is actually just you have with a location signal, you can now do all of these uh, things. And that was a new concept at the time. Um, but there are all these variations and extensions and corner cases and stuff that we didn't really have time to get in the paper. We sort of moved on to other things, but. Um, those are all still valid for uh, exploration. And we think about Monty in a, in a real practical system, you want to handle some of these, uh, many of these situations. So these are 
kind of research questions, I guess. Um, but you can see throughout it in the output layer, we enforced more stability in the neurons in a couple of different ways. And that does match the, the neuroscience evidence. Yeah. Okay, then Makarn. <laughs> So there's, there's no arrow I see going back from these layer two, three, or these output uh, layers back to those input layers. Yeah, so there is in the in the paper, I just didn't draw them in there. We can talk about that in a second. Okay, yeah, yeah I, uh, I just want to make sure we cover that topic. Okay, yeah, that's actually a somewhat confusing topic. But... <laughs> okay. okay, yeah. Carl. Um, computationally, is this just implementing this like intersection? Yeah, yeah, it's exactly set intersection, but it's doing it over time and space. So the question was, how could we do this with neurons in a way that maps to the biology? Well, this is a neuroscience paper. So voting is just set intersection. It's just set intersection. That's it. In, in this case, um, it's the intersection of there, unions specifically. Right? Yeah, which is just sets. You can think of it as just sets in the clean case. Um, but once you have noise and when you have this many to one mapping and things like that, then sets kind of break down a little bit. Something more than just simple sets. This, this, from a neuroscience point of view, solved two huge mysteries in neuroscience. One was how is it that your perception is stable when your inputs are changing? And the second one was why do we find all these horizontal connections between columns? Because it, it, it didn't fit in anyone's paradigm for how the cortex worked. And yet these, these horizontal connections are very obvious um, and they're everywhere. So it was a real nice solution to both of those problems at the same time. And they were, they were very fundamental problems um, um, confronting the neuroscience of the neocortex. So um, you know, the, the chance of this is being basically right is very high, I think, extremely high. Details, but, you know, maybe not so much, but. Let me talk about the feedback, which is a little bit, and then Vivian, maybe after that, I can get to your questions. So in the paper, we did have feedback connections here. Um, this is a somewhat confusing topic. So in the paper, we had a specific rule that we implemented there. Um, when UA looked at evidence for these feedback connections, um, it was somewhat sparse in the, in the literature. It was actually hard to find evidence that there's actually feedback from layer two, three to layer four. Um, he found some papers that suggested there might be some. And what we were thinking is what this would do is the output layer would bias the lower layers so that if there's noise or if you skip, skip an input or something like this, um, that's another uh, depolarization effect that happens here. There's, these connections would be on apical dendrites, which, which have a particular type of depolarization. But, but um, we'll, then what Marcus realized after we had published this, and that when he was doing the Collins Plus, is that we couldn't actually think of any scenarios when this blue arrow helped. <laughs> um, and we ran a whole bunch of scenarios with noise with and without these things, and these arrows didn't actually help. Um, so I, we actually left somewhat confused about this. Maybe there are still scenarios where this helps, but it's kind of interesting that in the literature, it's actually hard, hard to find these connections, and then we couldn't find that between these two layers specifically. When there's feedback, you know, other types of feedback, but this particular feedback connection, we never really found a good reason for it. So the reasons we thought it would be there didn't actually work that connection was actually needed. So that was kind of interesting. So yeah, there's I'm, a whole... I'm, a, I'm right now a little, so we left kind of confused whenever I really addressed that issue. So yeah. the, there's, go ahead, Abby. Yeah. Abby. Uh, if you were to implement that, that would just be apical support, right? Yeah, for we, we did implement it. So in the columns in our code, it is there. Um, but then when we tested it, it would be just apical support. Okay. And then there's different tie breaking rules and stuff that's there. So with and without it, we couldn't think of any. Okay, so now some more real confusing stuff. Um, in the columns paper, we assumed that the representation of the location um, 
was shared among objects, that two objects could have the same representational location, like, oh, this is this, you know, some corner in space. But in the Columns Plus paper, in the Framework paper, we moved away from that to realizing that the actual representation of location could be unique to the object. And therefore, the information that changes the need or even the perceived need for having this feedback. The feedback was to help the lower layers differentiate what the objects were. That's what the idea was, at least. But if, if, the, if the lower layers already know or have a unique representation for the object, it's not necessary. Um, and so that's one big twist on this, is that when you go to a representational location that is sparse and unique to the object, then you don't need that feedback. And the other thing is that these layer two, three cells do project uh, to other layers. They project down to layers five. And, um, and that's a very well-known projection. And so they could be influencing the location layer directly, uh, not, in, not influencing the layer four sensory input layer, but influencing the, the layer. Um, you know, it, could be telling, it could be telling the location layer, well, I know what object this is, therefore perhaps you should, you should you know, um, start narrowing down your locations to be unique to this object. So it's, much, it's pretty complex. Um, and I think there is, there is feedback from this layer, but it's not as it was shown in the Collins paper. I hope I didn't lose too many people on that. Yeah. Uh, Vivian, did you have a question? Uh, yeah, so to the point that you mentioned, Jeff, earlier. Um, so I understand it makes a lot of sense how the voting leads to the stability of perception during inference. But during training, it seems like the stability is kind of externally enforced, at least if I understand it right, how, how you're doing it, that you enforce it to have a stable representation. Is that right? And if yes, uh, how would this line up with the biology? Yeah, well, th that, that is right. Um, and you're, you know, basically to, to learn what an object is at a very high level, you have to do what we call tempo pooling. You have to say this pattern and this pattern in sequentially in time really represent the same thing. And the next pattern represents the same thing too. And the next, that's just a, a fundamental definition of what it means to do object recognition. You have to have multiple patterns that uh, are different inputs, but they represent the same thing. So this has to occur one way or another. And uh, we just assume that, okay, we'll do tempo pooling, meaning that we're gonna assume that the pattern the, the moment ago is still active while you, the next input comes in and then that is still active and so on. But it does, as you point out, Vivian, force us to say, okay, we're in sort of a learning mode right now. Um, we are trying to learn something new and we're gonna assume that there's a constant object underneath. And while we assume that we're gonna move our sensors. Um, I think that's a reasonable assumption um, that, uh, that during the learning of a new object, you would be in some sense concentrating on that. Um, um, and, and attending to it and enforcing those neurons to stay active, which would be different than during a say inference. Yeah. And that it's a much, um, it, it makes many fewer assumptions than like supervised learning and deep learning, uh, where there not only are we saying it's an object, we know we're saying specifically it's this set of cells that correspond, but this cell that correspond to object 23. So this is a weaker assumption meaning it's make, making fewer assumptions about it. It's just saying, oh, we have a new object. Uh, we know, we're not gonna tell you which cells have to be active. Um, but it does beg the question if you, and we've talked about it recently also, that if you learn part of an object, then you go away and learn another object and come back to an object, how do you automatically determine that you're in some object and continue learning that and things like that. So those, those are, I think, really interesting issues that we never, Kind of work through here, but there is there is information there because if, if there will be, you know, temple memory cells will be bursting or there'll be some surprise signal somewhere available. So somehow we can have a reset in, in the algorithm. Mm. Yeah, I think I, I think it's a reasonable assumption that when, while you're learning, you you have kind you kind of can assume that you're staying on the same object for over some time. The one thing I feel like you, you're missing a bit with, with the approach of saying, okay, this is the set of neurons that will be active for this uh, object is that 
you are not really learning bottom up from the sensory input, so it will be more difficult to share lower level features that are common across different objects or have more similarity in the objects yeah. um, representation. I, so I, I didn't follow. I, I, I didn't. I didn't follow that. So you're saying from top down, this will be the representation for this object. Um, so you can't uh, learn bottom up saying, okay, this object has similar sensory input to the one that I already know. So my representation will be similar to it. No, or I, I, both okay. Both objects have an edge like that. I, I think that's be careful because the system can recognize an object without this, without this temporal pooling voting layer. It's not necessary. If we narrowing down a unique representation of location and a unique representation of the feature, the system can uh, narrow down and infer and learn objects. Um, what you don't have is a stable representation for it. Uh, it's like learning a melody. I can learn a melody and not know the name of the melody. I say, yeah, I know this melody. I can predict the next note. I can predict the next note. But if you ask what the name is, I may not know the name, but I know the melody. Um, and so I don't have a stable representation for that melody. I just know what the next note is and the next note is and the next note is. So learning can occur and all this can occur from a bottoms up point of view. What's going on in this layer is it, it does two things. It allows adjacent columns to vote to, to reach a quicker consensus. And it allows us to have now a stable representation that we can classify if you want to put a name on the object. Um, but there's a lot of things you know the shape or the things like a melody where you don't have a name for it and you haven't, you may not have even done um, this step. Uh, uh, you know what I'm saying? It's like, <laughs> it's not required to recognize an object. Hmm. Yeah, I guess, I guess what I was thinking was, for instance, these dendritic segments, they're pattern detectors. So if two objects share the same feature, uh, they should be able to also share the same dendritic dendritic segment uh, and and then but, the, but 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 these but these dendritic segments in the in the voting layer are not features right they're not representing features at all um, they're representing the object so why should yeah, I don't it's, it, it, you know what one thing you might want is that the SDR and the output layer if two two objects are somewhat similar maybe there should be an overlap between those SDRs Right, that would be a nice, um, potentially a nice property to have. So if you have two different mugs, they might have more similar SDRs than if you had a mug and a car or something. Uh, right? So in that case, um, what would happen is the dendritic segment for that represents mug might have the same synapses than the dendritic segment that represents a car. I, I'm sorry, another mug. Right? Or you might have the same dendritic segment might end up somehow representing occasionally the same bug. Right? Yes. Those kind of things could happen. Uh, we never really worked through a lot of that, but it wouldn't be that everything is always the same. Right? There would mm -hmm. still be some part of the representation would be similar, some would be different. Well, this gets, this gets, to, the, this gets to the problem that Tsubatai always brings up, which is multiple people brought up, which is a problem of of um, classification or, or categories, right? And, you know, there's mugs, there's, there's certain types of mugs, there's ceramic mugs, there's my mug, you know, there's a whole bunch of things that we might say are, are similar or not. And in this scheme, the way we're doing the SDRs here in the voting layer does not, is not amenable to that. Um, the, the way we're doing the recognition in the location in the feature layers is amenable to that. Um, but it's a general, it's a problem we haven't really resolved. I think when we started out, when we first started thinking about SDRs, I was very excited because I, I really got into the idea that there'd be semantic overlap between the bits, right? But when you, when you go to these really sparse representations, it's hard to have the semantic overlap. Um, it, it's just, there's not enough bits to do it. And, and so if I only got 40 bits active, 40 cells active, there's not enough those cells really can't represent something. It just, the math doesn't work out that they could represent semantic meanings and I can do overlaps. Where you get the overlaps is when your SDRs are not so sparse, like the mini column SDRs. There you have like 10% of the, of the cells active or 10% of the mini columns active. Now you really can have semantic overlap, but when you get to this very sparse representation, it's, 
mathematically very difficult to imagine how it would work. So I think this is just a, an area that we haven't really finished uh, thinking through yet. Um, I'm not worried about it, but um, it, is a, it is an open area. Yeah, and ideally, you know, if we could get to the point where you have a new mug that you hadn't seen before, you could still recognize it as a mug. And then over time, you might learn a very specific representation of that mug. Like if you, first time you come to Nementa and you see a Nementa mug, you still know it's a mug, but after a while you have very specific, you might have a very specific representation of the Nementa mug. One little detail of neuroscience which I find intriguing, um, and I'm just trying to throw it out because it's for those who like the neuroscience, you know, there are layer, there are multiple layers in layers two and three. And some people have, just, have said there's four different layers in layers two or three, and, and they've mapped them out and so on. But there's generally an agreement about information flows vertically from bottom to top, up through layers from, from layer four to lower layer three to mid layer three to layer two and so on. And another thing, intriguing thing is that layer two seems to be the sparsest of all, ignoring layer one for the moment. Um, and, and so there's a possibility that somehow you're, you're, you're sparsifying the input as you go through these, you know, vertically up to layers two and three. It's an intriguing idea. I, I don't have a theory about it, but, you know, that's what the neuroscience says, that they're, they're not uniform. Uh, it's much sparser in layer two than layer three. And perhaps what you're seeing in layer three is some sort of representation where you have more overlaps, but in layer two, you don't. Um, so you could be voting on a category and on a specific object at the same time. So there's going to be an answer here. It's just interesting things to think about. And maybe the hierarchy plays a role in there too. We haven't really talked about that. Yeah. Um, you know, it's right. specific in some places, less specific in others. And things like that. You know, it's funny because a couple of months back, I, I gave a little, I had one day in the research meeting, I suggested a possibility for how to do classification, but I can't remember what it was. No, I'm sitting here going, what did I talk? <laughs> what did I talk about? Anyway. Well, it's probably recorded if you talked about it in the research. Yeah, I know. I'm starting to go through, I'm trying to go through some of the recordings. Uh, ben, you had a question? I do. This is going to sound like a stupid question at first, but bear with me. Um, what does the stable representation in layers two and three do for you? Like, in terms of acting in the world or an evolutionary advantage, like if, if there's if we don't have a use for that feedback from layer two three back down to layer four, is there a connection from layer two three to somewhere else that provides some advantage? Because it, it, there must be some output from that output layer going not just to other output layers to enable you to act in the world or make predictions or something. Do we yeah, have I mean, layer two three does that? yeah the, the layer two three does project to higher levels in the hierarchy, uh, for example. Um, not so not just to layer not just to layer three, but to layer four in the next layer four at the next level. Right. Um, right. So, so that's so there is a connection there, um, a pathway there. Um, okay. but so there's, you know, there's you, that and there's going to <coughs> layer five, right? Yeah, but there's also a notion of attaching some sort of a, a label to an object, not not a textual label, but a just a, a stable concept associated with a log. It's not associated with a specific point of touching. But there my percept of what a mug is, or the percept that I'm touching a singular object is constant over some time. Right? So, there's, there's a, so yeah. how, how do you implement that? And what we're saying is that this voting, you know, coming into a, you know, collapsing to a singular representation that's consistent everywhere while you are sensing an object, that's sort of one manifestation of. I'm not going to say the C word, but <laughs> sure. So <laughs> should I think of like, you know layer four as sensory and you know layers two and three as like percept? So there's sensation and then there's perception. Should I be thinking of layers two and three as percept? So some some well, stable representation of what you're sensing. Certainly, you're you're not aware of what's going on in layer four. You you are totally unaware of it, right? There's no consciousness of it. Um, you are, to some extent, aware of the stable representations. Of yeah, that totally but, counters what my, I had previously thought. I thought layer four was like, you were definitely aware of that. So this is a big update. No, 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 like you're not aware that your eyes are moving all the time, right? Three times a second. The complete input to your, your cortex is changing. You're not aware of it. 
yeah, this is stuff is changing constantly. Even, you know, as I'm looking at you, it's changing constantly. Even if I, even this if is I, ben, I, this says Ben, <laughs> this is like your nose on the left side of my, you know, retina. Now it's the nose, nose on the right side of my retina. It doesn't, I didn't, I didn't even notice that. Anyway, there's, and let's, let, let's get, so first of all, and there is feedback, as we said before, layer two and three feed forward as soon as I just said in the cortex. They also feed back to layers five in the cortex, in the same column. So yeah. there is feedback. And there's feedback and then, like this, there's feedback here. This, I mean, if I drew all the connections, it would be So let's talk about the evolutionary advantage of this. First of all, it allows you to infer what's going on in the world much, much faster. It's like, if I can only touch things with one finger, if I can only look at the world through a straw, my abilities to react to the world and understand would still be there, but it'd be extremely slow. It also allows me to take things like, you know, sound and touch and hearing. All, all these things are partially available and reach a consensus, even though either and none, none of the senses might be able on their own to tell you what's going on. So it's very quickly reaching a reality like this is what's happening. There's a huge advantage to that. Second advantage would be in your, in your episodic memory in your hippocampus. This is what you remember that you did. Right, you don't remember where your eyes were pointing at any millisecond here or any hundred milliseconds here, but you do remember the uh, there was Ben in this part of the room and there was Supertie in this part of the room, and I was getting hungry and whatever. So those are the things you want to store in episodic memory. You don't want to store the activities of individual column. You want to store like no, this uh, whole thing was here at this location. So that forms the basis of your memories, uh, your your sort of temporary memories about the world. Um, and that's essential for survival to, to say, oh, yeah, it didn't matter where my eye was when I was looking at you. It matters where you were uh, relative to my body. And that's those floating layers. So there's a lot of evolutionary advantage to this. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. I guess my question was. Um, <laughs> I guess I didn't answer your question. <laughs> no, you, well, you, first of all, you, you added something really important to my understanding that uh, you want to store basically something like those layer two, three SDRs, you want to store a model of what's happening, not a model of where your eyes were pointing. So that's a really good point. Um, I'm trying to ask a slightly, uh, and maybe we don't have an answer to this right now, but a, a further question of, okay, so I have this layer two, three, a uh, stable representation of the world. And you said it's evol evolutionary advantageous because it speeds up uh, inferring what's actually going on. And my question is, how do I use that to actually do anything? Like the evolutionary advantage might be I could react faster, but how is this stable representation actually helping me react? Well, be like, okay, so we have this voting going on. What do we actually do with well, that? Well, I mean, suppose this current sensory input is not consistent with a tiger in the bush, right, ready to attack me. It's just confusing right now, but the previous sensory input was. On the previous five was, I mean, wouldn't you want to still say there's a tiger? In that's, the that's not what I'm arguing. I agree with that. The question is, uh, you have to be using it somehow. So the question is, how are we using that layer two, three representation? I think Subutai was just saying, if you have a fear of, of tigers, um, you have to wait till you recognize a tiger. And if it takes you four seconds to recognize a tiger versus, you know, 100 milliseconds, well, that's a so then the, the, the evolutionary advantage would be moving or something. So there must be some relationship from these output layers to something that's involved in controlling movement. Uh, well, so, of course. So yeah, yeah. So this whole cortical column is very involved in controlling movement, of course. But layer, as, as um, Jeff mentioned, from layer two, three, there's feedback to layer five. So layer five within controls movement or helps control movement. So those go subcortically, but also this projects to higher levels as well. So this information does get transmitted all over the place. Yeah. By even more connections from there that I didn't. Okay. Yeah, we, you know, that, yeah, sorry, I, think, I know that was an obnoxious question, but I no, it wasn't. It, no, it, it wasn't. It's, 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 it's not, not at all. all. I mean, we're trying to carve out a piece of the problem, which is inference um, you, through movement of sensors. And, um, and so that's what we focused on. The columns in the columns plus paper, none of them talked about what you would do um, once you recognize something. And neither do most, you know, deep learning papers. You know, they think, okay, recognize that's a cat. Well, okay, fine. What are you gonna do about it? Um, so that wasn't the intent of that paper, those papers. 
but the, the, all the connections are there to do stuff with this. I mentioned the episodic memory. Um, so that I mentioned that it becomes the input of the next layer. So that would be sort of building hierarchical structured knowledge. Um, and, um, and then, you know, the direct feedback to motor areas in each column. So there's a lot of things there, but we just haven't, we didn't take advantage. We didn't do anything with that. We didn't, that wasn't part of these papers. Uh, Lucas, you've been pretty silent, but I think you had some questions. Yeah, I just had a question about how deterministic is this algorithm. But yeah, I think you answered it through the presentation that I've kind of knew this, the whole algorithm from before. So what was the answer? Is it deterministic? Well, not really, right? If you have the possibility of ties and then you have to solve ties, it's not going to be always deterministic. Well, 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 I guess the question is, what do you mean by deterministic? To me, means that deterministic means given the same set of inputs, you'd have the same set of states internally. Is that right? Is that how would you define it? Yeah, given you have the same input, you always have the same output, right? That would be the so so if, if, if I was confused, if I couldn't tell between B and C, that could still be deterministic, couldn't it? Um, just, yeah, let, let, me, let me answer it a slightly point. different way because there is randomness in here. We use randomness all, all over the place. But if you set the random seed in the code, you'll always get the exact same output, exact same set of cells, everything. So it's totally deterministic in that sense. But we do select cells randomly. We subsample randomly. We select the output SDRs randomly. You know, the winning cells are selected randomly. So there is randomness. Yeah, there, yeah. So, that, so in my view, that's stochastic. I mean, for setting the seed, you're making a stochastic process deterministic, but that's still like stochastic. Yeah, yeah, so we use example. randomness. We actually rely on randomness here. It's important uh, for things to be random to get the full SDR properties. But it's not probabilistic in the sense that we're not really using probabilities. But yeah. we are we are using randomness. Yeah. So so is this deterministic or not? I guess I don't really. No, or, no, it's know. not. It's not. It's not like you could have mm -hmm. uh, with the same input could lead to two different outputs. So it, 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 because you some randomness. Because you're assuming, that I, but because you're saying the, the seed idea that the, the random, random seed, seed yeah. that that doesn't count. Um, no, I mean, no, to me that's, it's still that's, deterministic. But uh, to me, that's still deterministic. Uh, like timing, you know, if you run on different machines, the timing doesn't impact stuff, and uh, order of execution doesn't matter or anything. Um, so it depends on what your de definition of determinism is. Yeah. I thought I was the procedure itself is deterministic. The voting procedure is totally deterministic. Yeah. I guess I was confused by what it's how I guess yeah, there's different. A couple of different de definitions of determinism. <laughs> All right. So I, I'm excused for being confused. Right. You could say if it runs in the CPU, it's deterministic. Well, no, not necessarily if there's multiple threads. The timing of the threads could make a difference, but here it doesn't uh, for order of execution. And so there are definitely cases where the algorithm is deterministic, but it doesn't happen. Deterministic way. <laughs> it's hard to debug those cases. One question again the, the intersection of union, right, which in this particular case, intersection of, you know, I mean, intersection of the sets and the winner take all is equivalent. Uh, in this clean case, yeah, but, but it's over time and spatially, but it's, oh, it's pure intersection. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what about the case, like, let's say we have this example here where we have uh, in the second row, we have. Let's say B, C, and then and then A, B, and then let's say nothing on the last one, and or let's say C in the last one. Yeah, so that was the case. When you take all, you could say B wins, but although the intersection is zero. Right. Yeah. So we're assuming here that every column gets consistent inputs, and the true object is B. It's never going to get something inconsistent with that. Um, if uh, you could imagine some sort of a majority rule where uh, if there's, you know, if column three is just getting complete noise, maybe we still want B and C to be active because right. that's the thing we didn't implement that, but you could imagine putting in, in reality, it's probably just something like that. Or if you're not getting any input, um, you can do it. Uh, you know, yeah, some I of these rules could still come into play. Remember, I, I said there's some persistence here. So if, um, if at time in the first sensation you have B and C, but the next sensation you're just getting random input, the B and C could still stay active potentially. Um, the other thing we've talked about is 
if there's no activity here, and if we have strong activity elsewhere, we could enforce B and C to come at them. So there's sort of corner cases, not corner cases, but situations like that that we did a model in the paper that in a real system you probably wouldn't want to. Right. So far, those things haven't been implemented. Not in the columns paper, yeah. But in a practical system, you might want stuff like that. Well, one thing, thing is, like one thing you definitely want in the practical system is, is a column that was not sensing an object and is now about to sense an object, uh, it, it should have an expectation of what it's gonna sense. Um, and, and so you would be, ideally, and maybe, I'm not 100% certain about this, but ideally a column that doesn't have any input should still have an activation of some sort in its voting layer. And, and it says, okay, well, everyone around me is saying it's object B, so I'm not getting any input right now, so I'm not thinking about it, but in a moment, I get input, and given my location, and I know my location, I'm getting an input. Well, then, I should predict X. You know, um, so I think columns shouldn't be totally ignorant. So there, there has to be a way of, and I don't remember how we did this in the columns paper. We did it but all. That, but, uh, I don't think we. Well, the, the, that's one of the feed. That was the idea behind this feedback. Oh, oh. Here, so we did. So we, we did do the voting then, and we. So, so the idea there is a column could have activation in layer three too, but not. Have any input, um, uh, right? So, but it would still then that would then that would lead to its prediction. Okay, so that's what that was about. I forgot. Yeah, that was the thinking. So, so I think that still occurs. It's just it's not going to go to layer four. It's going to go to layer five. So you know. Yeah. That means, yeah. yeah. So I think we're definitely running way over for the, such a short meeting. But um, <laughs> <laughs> says, says who? <laughs> well, ben doesn't want to stop, so he wants uh, to keep going. Yeah, but if you want to wrap up, we can. But how about one more? Uh, well, did we address all the questions in Slack? First of all, did we address? You had the most questions. Yeah, I had like, like, did we get I, all of yours? Or? I had three more. The, the three I asked, I can I can ask them later. Though, can but I think we addressed some of them, right? So I, there's like follow-up questions that I had. Um, <laughs> <laughs> If you can address the knife, everyone's not tired, it'd be good because then we have like this single video that extends the whole process and address all the questions. I we can refer to it later. I'm fine keeping, I'm fine going on. It's up to you guys. Uh, yeah, same. Yeah. Go all day. <laughs> you can go all day. I can go all day. <laughs> I'm going to soon have to do something biologically plausible. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I forgot about that. <laughs> The sensation was being voted out for me temporarily. <laughs> it is a terminus. Yeah. <laughs> My first one was that um, these models are all two layers, right? I wanted to extend this to more more than two layers, and I would probably have those feedback connections you were talking about, those two blue arrows you drew before you. Let me ask, what do you mean by two layers? You mean this is only between four and two, three? Yes. Yeah. So, so you mod like layer six, six five, 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 yeah, two, yeah. Three. Um, then I would need those other feedback connections you know, momentarily grew there, right? Um, yes, yeah, so in the Columns Plus paper, we added this layer six grid cell connection that we had a feedback between layer four and layer six, which is documented. And that was actually important in that paper. Okay, that's, that's for sure it's important. Okay. But in this one, two, three between uh, feedback from two, three to four is not uh, empirically as observed. It didn't do it. No, but maybe the stuff we were just talking about earlier where this column doesn't get any input at all, but the lingering ones do, and now it wants to no, 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 bias no, those. Yeah, so that was my question too. Yeah, it's like previously I was thinking of, and I think you even said at one point when I first asked you to go over voting, you described layer two three as acting like a pointer down to a detailed model, and another you know machine learning parlance for thinking about that is like encoders and decoders. If I've got this stable representation in two three, I might be able to decode that into some detailed model that says that could make predictions about what I'm going to sense at this new location at this object. Yeah. That, so without the feedback, that, yeah, the feedback definitely allows that. So that was the primary use case that I had in mind yeah. for layer two three is that it would enable predictions. Um, yeah, yeah. So how, but, but that but, was uh, not, you, you but in didn't practice, think that was useful in simulations. Well, in practice, yeah. let's say you didn't have that, this layer would get confused initially, but this layer would not get confused because of the temporal persistence. So it didn't make any difference to the convergence of the output layer. So, so yes, it would make a difference to layer four, though. It would make a difference to layer four, but it didn't have any impact on the 
layer two, three. Oh, no, that's that's a subtle three. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. But, layer, but since in, uh, yeah, I should say it didn't make any difference to our convergence graphs and all of the how fast you recognize I objects, see, I see. how many and all this stuff. But yeah, you would you could definitely see a difference here. Let's see your first thing. So that makes sense. Yeah. It's accurate to generalize um, feedback as sort of equal support everywhere anytime I do have feedback. I mean, the basic answer in neuroscience is no, it's always more complex. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, there's feedback that. I think there's feedback that does not go into the equatorial tendrite. Sometimes, like you could have feedback into the lateral tendrite segments or something else. But also, the apical stuff is a little bit complicated. There's a, um, the way it works is not exactly the same as the, the basal dendritic segments. Um, so it might. So, for example, I think it might be possible to actually invoke activity directly just through really strong apical form and there's this bursting stuff that happens at Matthew Barton talking about. So it's a little, I mean, at, at the first order of approximation, yeah, you could, okay, yeah, okay. I had another question about the, the, the okay, there was an example in the paper I thought was very nice and that was, if I have this digit that I'm looking at and it occupies a very small patch of the retina, and I don't need that many columns to recognize it. Um, but if that digit gets zoomed in and it occupies a larger patch, then the ability to predict what that digit is is entirely dependent on my the, the range of my horizontal connections in 2D. So I would need more columns than I had before. So my, my question was, does this same system of voting, does it still hold if I have a significantly more number of columns? And if, and if so, is noise ever an issue? Yeah. We, we didn't do this in the columns paper, but we, we did simulate the case of topology where so afterwards there was an intern who did that, where if you have lots of cortical columns, but there was here we assume that every column is connected to every other column. So there we relaxed that assumption and said, okay, a column is only connected to its neighboring columns. Yeah. Um, you know, and then can it still recognize objects? Um, and does this whole algorithm still work? So basically without any code changes, uh, we found it still converges pretty fast. It's a little bit, it's a little bit slower because it sometimes might take a few, couple of steps for information to you know, travel through using the same set of rules, but it still converges, it still works. Um, so I don't know if that answered yeah, your question or something. But it does. Yeah, because you can't assume, obviously you can't have n squared. Yeah, <laughs> connections and activity. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Um, and the question that I wanted to ask the most um, is how does voting take into consideration hierarchical connections between different modules? So can voting happen between- You mean like cortical columns? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm treating this as like one, yeah, yeah. So can voting happen between layer two, three of one hierarchy versus um, with another module of another, another hierarchy? Can, can that happen? Um, yeah, if there are, Jeff might have a better answer to this. Um, so as long as the connectivity is there, it should be able, I mean, this, remember this neuron has no idea where it's connections are coming from. So as long as the connectivity is there, uh, it should work. Um, there is also significant feedback projections that project onto the apical dendrites of these guys. So to the extent that the apical dendrite can participate in voting in a similar way, it should, it should work as well. Where's that coming from? Um, higher levels. I, I, was on, I was under the, an additional assumption, and I'm, I'm thinking now if I have evidence for this, but I thought it was. Again, yeah, remember these layer two, three cells, um, and all, all parameter cells, they send axons elsewhere in the neocortex. And my understanding is the layer two, three cells, they make a lot of profuse connections in, in, the, in the existing column and nearby columns, but then they send their axons everywhere. And, and that includes to other layer two, three cells in hierarchically higher regions. And this would make sense if the two regions are actually recognizing the same thing. Um, uh, it, or, or things that are associated with each other. Um, 
So my assumption has always been all along that yes, that voting occurs between hierarchical levels. Uh, it makes sense mostly between ones that are nearby, like you know, one level up, or one level down. But I don't, from a mechanism point of view, I don't see why it wouldn't work. And and um, it, it, I, I think it would. I think the evidence suggests that it does. Uh, again, you don't have, like I mentioned before, you don't have to. The different columns don't have to all be voting on the exact same thing. They just have to vote on things that are consistent with each other. So I can, a, an auditory column can, can recognize a sound, but that sound could be associated with lots of different objects. And that all works just fine. Um, and so again, you know, a, 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 a column in V1 could be recognizing something like a, um, that is consistent with something in a column in V2 is recognizing. Um, it doesn't have to be exactly the same thing all, in all cases. So I think the general answer is yes, voting occurs between layers and uh, levels of hierarchy, but it's complex in ways that we don't understand yet. So we tell you, uh, that apical uh, connection, hierarchical apical connection, do we cover that in any of our models in our published papers? Uh, we, we did model this, this connection, but not this hierarchical connection. Do we do we think that there's any um, is that something we want to address or is it not just not needed for our current models? Uh, no, I, well, I think Jeff um, explained some of that, but so some of it. So, example, you know, certainly voting uh, from other levels of the hierarchy, we do want to model that. Um, there's also another similar concept of higher levels imposing some sort of expectation on lower levels which I think of as just another form of voting, actually. Uh, but uh, people have shown that this, this feedback pathway can act in that way, um, that it kind of biases. Yeah. So this is one I mean, layer to what layer, though? Like from somewhere at a yeah. higher level down to the third piece? Yeah, what? it's confusing. So this is uh, often from layer six at the higher level. So that's why I'm, I want to be a little bit yeah. you know, hand wavy here. Um, but as Jeff said, there might also be, you know, connections. From layer three? Not, yeah, hierarchical connections that come. So from the, the it's general, I, I think there's a general question here, Kevin, about apical dendrites. So as our HCM neural model, so as we show proximal dendrites, we show basal uh, distal dendrites, um, and we show apical dendrites. We, and, and apical dendrites are different. They seem to, they seem to recognize patterns similar to how the basal dendrites do but then they don't summit the soma in the same way. And they have a different way of interacting with, it's more like a multiplicative effect, it feels like, but you know, when, a, when the apical dendrites recognize a pattern, it has like a, perhaps a multiplicative effect on the, on the soma. And so we don't really know. And we have not specifically modeled that. It's not because we don't think it's important because we haven't had a need to, we haven't figured out what to do with it. Um, and so the, every parameter cell has apical dendrites every single one, and uh, it's clearly important and there must be playing an important role, um, but we haven't been able to you know, identify a specific, not that we sat around and tried, but, you know, but we haven't identified a specific role for them in any of our models. Um, and maybe we'll have to, but, but at the moment we haven't, we haven't done that. Okay, fair enough, thank you. you know, like, just to give you a back, historical background on this, the way we go about this typically is not to say, here's a feature of a neuron, what does it do? Typically, we go about it, here's a function that has to occur in the cortex or in the neural tissue. How could it be supported by the anatomy? And, and so if we had a function that required apical dendrite, if the, the apical dendrite provided the solution to it, that would be great. But at the moment, we're not sitting around going, hey, this thing was stuck on, it fits. Okay, enough said. Yeah, so hopefully, um, you know, what I tried to do here was to demystify it, uh, voting a little bit and just talk through step by step and be very concrete and literal. Um, and yeah, so it was good. Uh, yeah. Hopefully that, that helped. Uh, it was good. Um, you, know, it hope, you know, there are certainly lots of things in here that we didn't think that would be good. It'd be kind of nice if someone were to sort of go back and lit, Take, make a list of all the things I, I said that we did have not done yet that might be interesting. That would be a, a really good roadmap of 
just to have available. Uh, I don't think that list exists anywhere. 